Okay, here we go. Matt Eversman, welcome to my podcast, man. How are you? Man, I, you know what? I could not be better and uh, fired up that you would even consider <laughs> having me on a show with 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 these savages. <laughs> well, listen, people are probably wondering how this came about. You and I got connected through my work, Any Question. People can now find you on Any Question. They can come there and ask you questions, which is absolutely brilliant, by the way. I'm going to be on there asking a ton myself and listening and learning. Um, that, that's a platform that you have been willing to join, and I'm, I'm very thrilled to have you on there. Yeah, well, again, kismet. And I, uh, you know, what are the odds that I would have an opportunity to sit here with you know, an Olympian, let alone an Olympic caliber coach. And uh, I mean that sincerely. You're, you're you're kind to include me with this this team of teams that you have on here. Yeah. Yeah. Really special people. I, I'm I'm blessed. I get to meet incredible people. Uh, the day after I spoke to you a couple of days ago, we actually I onboarded somebody that was uh, 20, 25 years in the FBI and was and doing all sorts of crazy things in the FBI. So it was just, I just I get to meet incredible people just like yourself and but I was, uh, you know, from the moment I met you, I, I just really wanted to talk more to you. And so I appreciate this. And for the people that are listening, uh, primarily, I told you are going to be high performance swimmers and coaches um, who listen to my podcast to kind of learn how to be better at what they do. And, uh, and ultimately, there's a lot of learnings and sharings that I'm sure uh, if anyone doesn't know your story, that they, they need to be looking it up right now. But I mean, your story ultimately has been told through, uh, you know, famously a movie called uh, Black Hawk Down. Um, and and let, let's just kind of go into uh, a little bit of ha your story and how it kind of came about. But ultimately, um, you know, you're in the, the U.S. Army in the, the 75th Ranger uh, Regiment out in uh, Somalia, Mogadishu. Uh, it's been well documented, obviously, with the movie Black Hawk Down. And you were there that day. Um, but in terms of just uh, your decision to go into the army, how did that come about? Yeah, so th this is actually as I was as you were saying this, I was thinking, you know, this this really is. Um, well, I, I can't teach anybody to go faster in the water. I think there are some similarities of my experience, your experience, and the listeners. And and the short answer is, I I uh, I was an absolutely horrific college student. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I started sinking from the first day of my freshman year, but I gutted mm -hmm. it out. Uh, for three years before they mercifully told me to take a little break. And, Where'd you go? Uh, I went to a small school in Virginia called Hampton Sydney College, which okay. I will tell you, uh, if you Google anything, Google that. It, you know, it's a, one of the last three, I believe, remaining all-male non-military schools in the country. Um, beautiful place, great for liberal artists. I just wasn't mature enough to to, to make it through. But that's a great story. Uh, Brett, for a, for another day, but I only use it as a backdrop. You know, I, I kind of hit rock bottom as a young man, and and trying to figure my way, mm. you know, out and about. I'm like the army seemed like a good deal, and I mm. I joined the army, and from there I I found a little bit of I had a little bit of aptitude, and I wound up, you know, making it into the special operations command, into the to the ranger regiment, which eventually got us, you know, into to to this experience called Black Hawk Down. But you know, that journey I think is where you know, there is a little bit of, um, you know, there is a little, there's a lot of similarity in there about, you know, young men and women striving to be the best. Right, right. Well, we'll play up that a little bit in terms of getting into the, the Ranger Regiment. That, that's an elite unit, right? I, I, I mean, it's, I'm sure it's a selected group of people. Uh, what age were you at that point? And what are the what are the qualities and distinctions you had that enabled you to get into that? Yeah. So, and forgive me, because, you know, you've known me for 30 seconds and yeah. it's easy to sound, you know, when, when we start, or I always feel like when I start saying like, you know, terms like elite and right. tip of the spear and, right. you know, the best of the best, all those things that we, we normally say when we think about um, organizations that are very high performing, high yes. performing individuals and institutions. You kind of start, I feel like I sound like an elitist and probably deserve a punch in the mouth for saying that. <laughs> so forgive me as I, I, I answer that question. You know, I joined the the big, call it the big army, um, uh -huh. which was a little more difficult than say fraternity house living, but really not by a whole lot. And right. I mean, listen, it, it, you know, you get your head above water, no pun intended, and do the right thing. You know, you're going to, succeed you'll be a, a moderate success right and so what i found was you know now this is the first time in my life i've had high standard or higher standards applied to me 
the opportunity to be in a unit that is given great authority and great responsibility, like the Rangers and the Green Berets and Delta right. and Steels, um, requires a little more um, sacrifice. And, you know, what you find when you get to these units is that um, the standards are considerably higher and not fictitiously right. kind of guesstimate Hollywood higher. This is like published standards are, you know, fraternity house, army, ranger standards. And, right. and it, that sounds like an infomercial, but, you know, for me, that was that was that was even more compelling than any of the sexy stuff that you think rangers do was right. this, this opportunity for a knucklehead to potentially you know, be with the best if I really apply myself and, and yep. give it 100% and then some. Yeah. Long winded answer. I apologize. No, listen, Matt, I, w I was the head coach at Auburn University for, for 10 years and, and, and I swam at Auburn uh, previously to that. And, and we won national titles as, as a swimmer. And, and then as I went into coaching, we won some national titles as a coach. And I would have, once I became a coach, I would have athletes come to us at Auburn and say, I want to be part of this elite unit. I want to be part of this national championship team. And it was quickly found out that some of them were built for that and some of them weren't, right? And so we would bring them in. And and look, we, we would have to do our, our own vetting, but you couldn't you could never really tell until someone was in the the unit or the the, the team. Yeah. Um, but there were people that thrived in that environment and people that crumbled. Uh, I'm sure it's the same with you and the Rangers. So I could give you detailed uh, points of what separated those people and what made us great and what, what we were striving for. Tell me the comparisons with the ranges. You said the standards were up here. What are some of the particular standards that held them to that kind of level? Yeah, and, and listen, it, it, it's, it's an A to Z kind of thing. And remember, you know, we're, we're talking about this is all the people business, whether we're, right. whether we're swimmers, lacrosse players, yeah. rangers, or – you know, yep. fill in the blank mechanics. It's yep. all about getting the best out of people. Right. So for, my, for instance, to answer your question, my experience going from the the conventional army yep. to this unit, first of all, like there was a, a physical fitness standard. Right. Um, and listen, you know, when we say standards in the army, most of us out here sort of think like it's very binary, you either make it or you don't. Well, that's really not true. You know, there's a, you get a lot of chances in the big army to to succeed for a variety of reasons that right. when you get to that start getting up to that pinnacle category yes. mm -hmm. um it is very binary it's pass fail so right. you individual has a, a responsibility to to not only meet but to exceed that standard and again it's published and it's considerably higher than the rest so right off the bat you know going in whether or not i like my boss or don't if i don't you know, at least at a minimum, meet this professed physical standard. Uh, I'm on the way to Korea, man. Like, right. and it, I've got no, it's not like, hey, Matt's a good guy, but he can't do push ups. They're like, Matt's a good guy, but he can't meet the standard, so beat it. So that's a, was a big one. Holding everybody accountable to a physical fitness standard, um, I thought was, was, was an eye opener to me. Then, you know, there were standards of proficiency for your actual, craft you know if you're a a, a rifleman for instance and we don't need to bore everybody with the vernacular of of light infantry combat but you know right. everybody's job has, has has standards that they must meet in their performance of their daily duties and you know this idea of you're being judged and watched in a good way by your peers in command there's like a 360 um you know that that dog on the performance evaluation going on you know, every day it's a self-flicking ice cream cone of 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 uh, accountability. Right. But once you you find that's administered um, fairly and equitably, you know that's when units start to thrive. At least for me. So I keep it going back to you know the standards for for your fitness, the standards for your performance, the standards for the way you wear your uniform. You know, drilled into your head every time you leave the compound, you represent. Every single ranger in the army. Yes. So don't you know? So you better not mess it up, or you know, I'm I'm, I'm going to put heads to bed. Uh, right, maybe, right. Maybe yeah. not literally, but so, you get so, my drift. So very similar, you know, very similar in terms of high performance is high performance, right? And standards are standards, and and the best have them, and that's why the rangers have them. That's why national championship teams have them. Uh, you know, I'm seeing some some footage right now, you know, just on online of uh, 
you know, uh, who's the new football coach at Colorado that that's uh, everybody's yeah, excited Dion. about? Yeah, Dion, right? Like, so Dion's out there and kind of showing everybody like, hey, there's a standard here. And then, and that's it, you know, uh, six, uh, winners win, you know, and, that, and that's kind of the standard they live by. And it makes other people uncomfortable. And the ones that are uncomfortable, uh, you know, drop out pretty quick. And I think that's what the message he was given to his team the other day is like, hey, this isn't going to be for everybody. You're all, you're all aren't going to make it here, you know? And so, uh, but that's, that's reality of life, right? And so um, what about this? This is this is the year 1993, isn't it? When you when you uh, yeah. are in, okay. So 1993, I had no idea the U.S. were in Somalia. Like, when did you first find out that you're going to Somalia to do some work? Yeah, 1993, uh, and, <laughs> and I say that sort of jokingly. And we're, gosh, we're talking 30 years. Um, in uh, only reason I had heard of Somalia, honestly, was that. In the, um, you know, in the 70s, I guess, uh, as I recall, there had been a, a, a very dramatic experience where, you know, um, the German special for, you know, special operations guys, uh, GIG or whatever, the GSG, um, took down a Lustanza hijacked aircraft at, right. Um, right. you know, I remember that. I'm like, I, I never heard of Mogadishu. Yeah. Fast forward, uh, you know, 92, um, I had some friends that had deployed as part of this UN. It was peacekeeping. It was go, you know, feed the hungry, feed the starving in Somalia, uh, which, uh, you know, cool. That's good. That's what, you know, some troops do. That's not for the the, the Ranger Battalion. And okay. then, uh, you know, it was it wasn't until the spring, you know, late spring, June of 1993, uh, that we got alerted to to that there might be this this mission going on, but quite candidly, you know, I, I never I knew nothing about I literally knew nothing about the history of the country, zero. I mean, sub-Saharan Africa, Horn of Africa, who knows? Turns out there's quite a bit that we should have known, but you know, yeah, it was just this little blip on the radar. I, I you know, I don't want to say who cares, but but who cares? You know, right. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it, was the Iraq war going on at the same time or not? No. So this was in the, the this was after the, okay. uh, the, Just we, after. We had the Panama invasion in, in, in 1990 or 80, December of 89. And then we went to uh, Iraq in, in, in 1990, 91. And then, you know, this was peacetime. This was uh, right. OK. You know, I was going to say that. Yeah. Going on. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So this, this in your mind, this is peacetime, and they're sending you to somewhere you've never heard of, and what the hell are we doing kind of thing, you know? Uh, why the Rangers? Um, did they give you information up front of why why the Ranger unit needs to go out here in particular? Yeah. Now, so, it, you know, once it was determined that um, there was a need for a force like the Rangers to go, um, it became very apparent. Listen, the, this particular mission – was to capture or kill this this warlord named Mohammed Adid, uh, who's a horrible uh, guy. He was just okay. a bad, by, by all accounts, bad bad guy. Killed a lot of his own people, um, or shaped the future for their deaths. Um, corruption at its finest. I mean, just just Google Godfather, and that this this dude's face will you know pop up. So he was a bad guy. Uh, had killed a bunch of Pakistani soldiers, you know, members of the the UN. Uh, and needed to be brought, you know, to justice one way or the other. And I know it sounds sort of, you know, I'm being cavalier and I don't mean to. I'm actually being completely serious. This uh, the, the the U.N. Security Council wanted this guy caught or dead. And uh, no one else in the world, literally no other force uh, member of the state of the, the U.N., you know, was willing to do it except the United States. Madeleine Albright, Secretary um, Albright was the one that said, you know, we'll we'll do it. We will commit. Special operations forces to go get this guy. And Matt, uh, you uh you just gave me chills for the first time talking about it and then me realizing that you were actually there, and then me realizing that I've watched Black Hawk down like 50 times and and knowing that I'm talking to the man that was actually there now. It's like it's freaking me out a little bit. So um so so you how many how many of your guys, how many how many of the troops are on the ground now um for this mission? So we had, um, and, and this is roughly, you know, so don't, don't go testifying in front of court about it, but yeah. uh, we had to call it a, a hundred and twenty five um, soldiers and that's, that's Rangers and Delta Force 
guys that would be, you know, literally on the ground in a fight, you know, on a mission. And then, but then you have, you know, we had, uh, you know, 20 helicopters. So that you got mm-hmm. their crew, um, you know, so 20 times 40, 50, call it, you know, 60, 70 of that, plus their maintenance guys. So all total, we probably had about 500, and eh, might be pushing it, maybe, maybe, maybe 300 um, members of Task Force Ranger, you know, in Mogadishu on that, you know, for that deployment. But at uh, any given time, you know, I would say put a hundred and a quarter, you know, on the ground, actually, you know, boots on the ground right, to, to right. use the phrase. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, even if all 500 just upped and went into the city of Mogadishu itself, you're still completely outnumbered. Like how many people were in Mogadishu? Yeah, we were told that uh, Mogadishu is roughly the size of Houston, Texas. There's about, at the time, about 2 million people. Oh, God. So when you think about it, you know, when you're, honestly, just to put it in, you know, box it up for a second. Um, you know, Brett, we're talking about, you know, go find one guy in a city of 2 million people, hmm. you know, like, and this is 1993. We don't have Google search, you know, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that's how it goes. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a, that sounds like an impossible yeah. task yeah. for anybody. Hmm. And I will only throw this out to you and again, not to take all the oxygen in the room, but, you know, when we were briefed on this mission, I knew enough to know, you know, that's really hard. I mean, it is a hard mission, but it's not impossible. And we absolutely 100% have the capability to do this. And, you know, oh, wow. with a little bit of, of ego, um, I would I would share, I could say that out loud now, uh, no one else in the world could even attempt it. Wow. Which gets us back to this commentary about elite and being on that kind of a you know, in that kind of a unit, that that's the mindset. And by again, I, I'm I'm tired and old and bald now, so you know I, I, I could talk a big game. But at the time, I, I, yeah. I swear that was that was the mindset that 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 everybody had. Had had you know, in terms of preparation, I, I liken it uh, to what you're talking about. I liken it to somebody that is finally made an Olympic team and is going to the Olympic Games is going to compete against the, the the rest of the world at the Olympic Games. That that's kind of the way the preparation is. Like, like you got to be the best of the best. You got to be the, the the best trained. You got to be the most prepared. And then in order to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games, you you've got to be better than everybody else. And you've also got to have that confidence and that belief that you just talked about of like, hey, no one else can do this. This is I'm the best for this. So that's the same mentality as well. How did you as a young man know that you were ready for your Olympic games at that point in time? Had you, had you fired your, your rifle at anyone before that? No, not until we got to Mogadishu. Um, I didn't, uh, wow. I, you know, and I say that again, smiling now, cause you, you look back on it and you realize how much you didn't, how much I didn't know, you know, how much yeah. I didn't ask of people that had information that could have right, helped right. me mentally prepare for this prior sure. to you. Um, but to, to answer that question, you, you know, the, the, the thing is, somebody told me afterwards, um, you know, in order to be the, 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 the best, you know, you really just have, you don't got to come up with a new gizmo or gadget or something, you know, take it in the spirit it's intended. You know, you, you've just got to be able to do the basics at a PhD level. Right. Like that's it. You know, a, a gun is a gun. It, it, End of the day, it shoots a projectile through the barrel somewhere that you aim it. It's how well you're able to do that test, that's what matters. So you've got to be able to do it, you know, in the cold, in the heat, in the snow, in the rain, in the sleet, in the mud, and all that stuff. You know, that's what separates, you know, okay and average from the exceptional. And again, I know it sounds like an infomercial, but but the fact of the matter is if you can't do your job, you know, if you can do it well at the day and you can't do it at night, then you're worthless. You, you bring nothing to that fight. So learning that, for me, this is my back and into the, the answer, you know, I realized at at worst, I could at least keep up. I right. remember when that was young Matt Eversman thinking, like, man, they, they haven't fired me. Um, I'm keeping up. I might even admit there are some things I can do, you know, as good as, if not maybe a little bit better than, than some of my peers. And not that it's always competition, like, you know, jockeying for a position to put them out but you know you're aware like you know how people are doing you can't help it and unless you want to just make sure you're not the you don't want to be the slow man 
You don't want to be the 11th guy. So that was sort of my mentality coming up to this long answer to your question. Um, I honestly would say I I, I realized I could at least keep up and, um, you know, with, with, with keeping my head screwed on straight and focused, I was keeping up um, with a little bit of breathing room. If yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I've seen the movie multiple times. If you haven't seen the movie, it's one of the, the greatest movies of all time, but it was certainly one of the, the best war movies of all time, um, without a doubt. Incredible actors in it, well made. I've talked to you uh, personally about this uh, in terms of how accurate is it, and you you know you told me that obviously it's it's a movie, but the the in terms of the a lot of the scenes and things like that, very, very accurate, right? You know, but uh, they've got two hours to condense a lot of the timeline and things like that. But tell me this, how did you end up as one of the main characters in this in this storyline, right? Like of all the people that are out there fighting, um, you were played by Josh Hartnett, who's one of the main uh, actors in the movie and one of the, the leading roles in the movie. How is this you, Matt? Like what, how did, you, how did this come about, man? Well, clearly it was my looks. You can tell <laughs> as you look at this mug. You do um, look like Josh Hartnett a lot. You know, why wouldn't you put that on a movie poster? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I say that really purposely to be a little cheeky, uh, you know, because no one knows. I, I don't know. I, I have a couple of ideas about how this all happened, and some of it is complete happenstance. Because, listen, there's 150 guys hmm. engaged in the fight, yeah. and there's about 149 of them that did far more heroic and brave and incredible things on the battlefield today, men of all ranks. Um, you know, how could Eversman be the one? And and I happen to think, honestly, that it was nothing more than when when Mark Bowden, who's the author of, of Black Hawk Down, um, came down to Fort Benning to do the interviews with the Rangers, um, you know, he was given a list of, you know, 10 guys that he would be allowed to speak to. And for for who knows why, I was the first one scheduled for my interview with him when he wrote Black Hawk Down. When he wrote the book, um, if you open up the front page, the first sentence is that, you know, at liftoff, Matt Eversman said a Hail Mary. And maybe, I don't know, the book did very well. And, you know, my men and our chalk position sort of was the first bit of this whole war story that he told. And I, I think it maybe just made it easy for them, but uh, that's the best. Honestly, I I've never asked, no one's ever shared with me. Um, it definitely was not um, out of, you know, competence or any kind of measurable uh, success on the battlefield that we're like, Oh man, you want to see, look at everyone. That guy did it. Cause I'm telling you, Right. That, that'd be totally false. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, I think- I, I, in that situation, there's no, there's no one person that's better than anybody. There's no hero. There's, there's just a unit that is working together to get a, a mission yeah. accomplished. And you yeah. were part of that for sure. And I, and I appreciate um, your humility in that sense. But um, tell me this, when did, when did it all go to shit for you? When, when did it start to like really go crazy for the moment that you were on the ground? Yeah, well, it actually started before we got on the ground. Uh, so on this mission on October 3rd, um, you know, there's there's 19 helicopters that are that are flying in on, you know, to come in and do this this mission, this hit on this target. And it, my helicopter happens to be the last one going in. So you can oh, imagine wow. with if you could just picture a sandstorm, you know, over the city and 20 helicopters flying in. And how dusty and dirty and uh, impossible to navigate and see it would be. That's it. And so our before we even got on the ground, our pilot is talking over the air airwaves saying, "Hey, we're in the wrong spot." Mm. So, so but, but you don't even have a chance, and you can't even see where the right spot is because it's literally a sandstorm. Um, mm. So that kind of kicked it. We 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 all knew on our chalk on chalk four. That's a a chalk like that white stuff you use on a board. That's what we we refer to as a helicopter, a group of uh, people on a helicopter. Our chalk knew before we got on the ground that we were behind, you know, the the, the power curve here. Um, and it, you know, I've told this to a million people. Uh, for our our guys, my guys on chalk four, um, we were in the wrong spot 
with a, we had a kid fall out of the helicopter, which, you know, Murphy's law happens. Um, we didn't have any, our, our radios went down and we got into a firefight all within the first 20 seconds uh, of that mission on that day. Um, wow. I mean, it, 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 it's surreal to think about. Uh, and, and quickly uh, thereafter, everybody else on all the other members of the task force were engaged in fights all the way around that. that so you had multiple battles going on almost instantaneously. Wow. Crazy stuff. Hey, but uh, I mean, I, I, I have nothing to compare that to, so I, I can't, I can't explain that one. But uh, one of the things that was coming to mind, as you were saying, you were kind of flying in, in this group of, of 20, you know, um, the only thing I can relate it to is, is being at the Olympic games and, and the hours and the moments before your event, you know, when, when you know, you got to be at your best, you got to perform at your highest level. And you're just saying to yourself, like you said, that prayer, you're saying to yourself, like, this is it, man. Like, I've got to be at my best now. There's there's no, I can't go back here. Like, I trained four years, well, probably a lot longer, but ultimately four years to go to the Olympic Games. And and I, I was given 20 seconds, to, 22 seconds to perform. I swam the 50 freestyle. Wow. So, like, the whole day I'm thinking to myself, I've got 20 seconds to get this right. I, I could, I, this could change my life. You know, it wasn't life or death, believe me, but there's a lot of, there's a lot at stake when you're in that moment. And I'm sure it sounds like that helicopter moment for you is that moment for you where you're like, it's game time. And like, th there's no turning back now. Right. Yeah. Listen, and, 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 you know, I would, I would uh, clearly, you know, there's, there's very few other comparable experiences right. outside of, someone shooting at you that we could all look at each other and say, ah, that's exactly the same. However, uh, emotionally, there's a lot of experiences that we all have, like what you just described, right. Brett. Uh, it's exactly right. I mean, it's almost your spatial reasoning. Yes. Constricting that you're, 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 yeah. you're either so focused or just so cloudy. It doesn't matter. I'm not sure which one yeah. where you're like, I, I just got to get in and go. I have yeah. no choice. Scared right. or not. Doesn't matter. People are relying on me. I, I've got to go out and do my best. And 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 I got to hope that that's good enough. And you know what? And here's the lesson from combat that I, I would throw out. Um, and and, and I, it stings a lot of young soldiers, and particularly young officers. Like I was talking to West Point cadets. Uh, I'm like, you know, the reality of combat, unfortunately, is that very good men and women that are very well trained, you know, best of the best with the greatest equipment and the best technology are going to die on a battlefield by an inferior enemy. It's right. just a right. reality of combat. Right. And it, that sucks. That just blows to think, Hey, wait a minute. We're, we, we, we've done all this hard work and we've done all this stuff. We, we, we're, we're bound to win. It's like, man, you know, any yeah. given Sunday. No. Yeah, yeah. And that was hard. That was a, that was a lesson I learned a, a tough way um in combat for the first time so back i'm just bringing that back yeah. you, go, well, you got 20 seconds you, and, yeah. and you know what you stubbed your toe that morning or you yeah. broke a shoelace or yeah. you know whatever it was I, I mean man that sucks if it doesn't go our way but but what are you gonna do whine about it i mean well you, you, that's you, the other thing i want to bring up too is like you know a lot of, a lot of athletes say to me uh you know a, a, an athletic term in swimming is oh i missed my taper i didn't i didn't get everything right on the day i could i could have you know things could have gone better and what i realized as a professional athlete in order to perform at the highest level consistently is you had to eliminate any excuses on that particular day like the, the paris olympics for all the swimmers that are going to go to the paris olympics next year They've set the date of when the event is going to happen. You know that on July 22nd of 2024, the 50 freestyle is going to go off or whatever event you're in, that's going to happen. That whether you wake up that day with a headache or a stomach ache or a, or a, a chipped toenail, whatever, is, it's happening that day. And that's the same mentality with you guys is like you don't get to choose the battle and when it goes, but you have to be ready for it, right? Yeah. And, you know, that I think that mentality, honestly, that permeates, I could only speak America. I know it's like in Australia, but that mentality or the anti of that, the corollary to that, I think is what permeates out here that we've been so accepting that I can make an excuse. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I, I right off the bat, I, I'll make an excuse for whatever, and I don't have to show any responsibility. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's never me. And again, no. I sound a little preachy, but no, no, that's for amateur. That that you understand when I say amateurs, I mean you know, knuckleheads. They, yeah. they, we're talking about being at the at the at the at the tip top. Yeah, driving yeah. to be there. Yeah, I, I think you, you said it perfectly. You're like, there are no excuses. No. There's just, there's just the realities and no. you know, damn it. You, you, you better go and you, 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 you know, we always lose a joke. It's, you know, try, you know, go or dry, die trying, you know, yeah. Spartan kind of stuff. And yeah. you know, people, yeah. people say that with, I think people say that and now it's become kind of cool and hip to be like, we're all tough guys. But at the end of the day, it's uh, like, no, you're no. really not that the ones that are, they're the ones that do exactly what you, you said. Yeah. And they even yeah. know that they, and that might not even be their best. You know, they might yeah. not be the best that day. Yeah. But they, yeah. they go do it. And uh, yeah, I've heard so many people at that level come up with stuff. E- even even the best of the best, which then separates the ultimate best from the best. You know, like the pool's cold today. Like the 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 wind is blowing too. Like what the you know the the black hawks are flying in. That they're, they're blowing up all this dust, and you're going to complain about the dust. You can't yeah. see people. Like big deal. You know, yeah, it's a buddy. Find a way to win. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's that's all I can. That, there, there's so many cliched phrases, yeah. but when I look back, Brett, you know, that is one. You, you people are like, well, you know, in training, hey, sergeant, first sergeant, you know, I can't do it. I'm like, dude, yeah. find a way to win. What do you, what do you yeah. want me to do? What yeah. do you want? I can't change the weather. Yeah. And that's the so, separator, man. That is the separator between the elite and the not elite. And that's what you were you were trying to get to earlier. Is not to say that you know, I'm better than anybody else, but the elite mentality is you get the job done under any conditions, under any circumstances. You've got to. And that doesn't mean to say, like you said, that that good men don't die in in combat. That we know that. And I'm not taking that away. These these all of your men were prepared, and the ones that died, um, you know, were were just as prepared as you. So I'm, I'm not taking anything away from them, yeah. you know, but, um, yeah, tr- th- but uh, let me, let me ask you this then. Um, here, here's a personal question. I've never asked anybody this. What does it sound like or feel like uh, when somebody's shooting at you? Um, when people say that's a great question, they're usually just trying to have filler, but I'm telling you, thank you for asking. That's a great question because I never had any idea what a sensory overload right. combat in general would be. Right. Um, and first of all, it's it's so loud. And I'll bring back, I'll, I'll, I promise I'll get to the bullet uh, question in a second. You know, but you you get on this battlefield and, you know, it's 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 chaos and it's just so loud. Mm. Like your ears, I, I mean, I lost here, my hearing, you know, God, I wear hearing aids in both ears because it's so loud, so loud that your molars, Literally, your your teeth feel like they're going to fall out. It's so loud, and it smells. See, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Oh, it, unbelievable! And then the smell of the sulfur and the or the gunpowder, mm. you know, like it overwhel- It's almost it gags you. You know, mm. when you're in a in a pretty big fight, you know, and you're shooting so much, you're like uh, the the smell of that gunpowder, like just mm. sticks with you. It's, it's disgusting. It gets in your mouth because you're you know right. you can imagine you're. Your, your rifles right next to you. And, you know, so all these senses are going on, you know, so quickly. I mean, it's like zero to 90. And then all of a sudden there's this, the the first, and again, Brad, I just quick TV time out. I could only speak for myself and, and yeah. other people yeah. that have been in the same position might have a different uh, answer. But for me, it was overwhelming sound. So I can't quite hear everything like you do in the movies, you know, they're like, oh, if you hear it snap, it's really yeah. But you get this this sixth sense of rounds coming coming at you and coming by you. And then there's right. this this other part where you realize, hey, I just heard a bullet and it sounded close to no shit. That guy is someone's literally got me in their their crosshairs, in their sights. And it's indescribable yeah. other than you feel it. It makes mm. your hair stand up and you will, you, and I say you, I mean, to me, go through moments of almost paralyzing fear. Like you're like, wow, that yeah. guy's really shooting. So just incredu- incredulity. Yeah. Like, wow, that yeah. guy's shooting at me. And thankfully yeah. it was more of the, the latter for me. Like, oh, you know, not like, ha ha, but okay. You know, now I know what it's like. 
Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really, um, it's not a, a good feeling to be shot at. And it's no. easy to sort of joke and be cavalier later. But um, I tell you at the time, it, it's, it's, it's pretty doggone scary to me. This battle went on for 18 hours. So in that 18 hours, how how much of that do you think were you being shot at during that time? Yeah, so I got out uh, on the evening of October 3rd. So I got was able to get out on the convoy. I didn't uh, didn't get stuck in the city on uh, uh, you know at the, at the down helicopter site. So but for those three hours, um, I would say pretty much for about three hours straight, I was in in the mix we were being shot at the whole time i mean we left mogadishu we left that that area on the day of the battle um in a humvee one of many passing around a, a nine millimeter pistol because we were all out of ammo um from shooting too much i had like 30 magazines three zero mm. wow so three zero. You know, it, wow. Was, it was it was a lot and so, so you're just going to go through a magazine, throw it, get the next one in, go again. Um, are you, are you on the streets? Like, are you, or are you in inside buildings? Where were you during the battle? So for the pretty much the whole time we were out, we, my guys and me and my particular chalk. And again, we realize there's, there's a lot going on or multiple battles, you know, for yeah, this whole right, story. Right. Um, you know, we happen to be in a position where we were fighting outside uh, in the streets. A lot of guys wound up, you know, being in a hard site on the in interior, clearly fighting, you know, from inside to out, which is good. You know, again, it's not like, hey, who's smarter or who's more brave or dumber or who knows. But uh, just yeah. listen, on the yeah. battlefield, you make decisions based on the information you know and what's available. And I think it just so happened where we were. There was no... There was no place that we could tactically um, position ourselves to uh, continue on with the commander's intent for our mission and be inside. So we had to be outside behind cars and, you know, whatever kind of cover you could find. Let, let me do this then. Let, let's go back to high performance and um, and focus. I mean, obviously, for those three hours, you got to be in, in peak focus. you got to be on your game for that whole time. How how did you stay focused? How does how does one you know how could we relate it to other people in terms of staying focused on a task? Yeah, so I've I've thought about this. Uh, you know, in the in the military, you know, there's clearly for ninety nine point nine percent of all the operations, there's always a team. You know, so there's right. multiple people um, right. and multiple right. people, regardless of your rank in a hierarchy. So. Even though we know that Matt's, you know, uh, on the masthead in charge, you know, I've got seven, eight, ten guys that are, are are working for me, but part of my team. Right. Right. And I've got just as much um, responsibility to be a good teammate to them yes. as they do, you know, a follower and a teammate to me. So the whole point of it is that what I realized is that when I was getting scared as a leader. You know, I could look at my, any of my men and watch them doing their job, you know, on the battlefield. And I thought, man, look, that guy's not afraid. That guy's not scared. He's still doing his thing. Um, so I better dog on fake it. If, if nothing else, I better fake it, but still do my job. And realize again, right. by the way, it's okay to be scared. It's human, but you still got to perform. Right. And only right. to find right. out afterwards, and, and this again, to back into the answer, you know, to find out afterwards when I'd say to one of these young guys, Guys, I'm like, man, man, I, you know, Dave, I, I saw you, and you, you were, you were just getting after it, and uh, you really gave me me strength. And this guy saying, well, I was so scared, Sergeant, but I saw you, you know, doing your thing, and you didn't look scared at all. So that made me like, you know, you have this symbiotic relationship. Right. So it was all yeah. coming out to, you know, um, yeah, there are times you got to dig it out yourself, um, but thankfully for me, I always had somebody around right. me. That I could that could kind of give me that 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 bit of a charge, you know, that, right, that right. little bit of jump. Yeah, I actually, you know, as you're saying that, I can absolutely relate to that scenario. Um, not not the life and death part, but the part where you're relying on your team and and you're looking around. I remember I qualified um, 
you know, second fastest for the, the national championships, the NCAAs and the 50 freestyle, I qualified second fastest for the final. And I remember being nervous as hell as a freshman. You know, I was 20, 21 years old at, at swimming in college and I was a freshman. And, and I remember looking, I remember thinking to myself, I'm nervous as hell right now because I've got to go out and compete for the national championship. And I remember looking across at my teammates and drawing strength and energy and pulling pulling energy from them saying i'm not equipped alone to do this but when i look at them i i can i can grab their energy and their strength and it made me fierce it made me feel indestructible at that point in time so i went from feeling you know completely uh you know meek and mild and and scared to uh indestructible and powerful at that you know moments just looking at my team and that sounds like it's very similar to what you did Oh, I, I, what it, I mean, it's it's word for word. It's exactly that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, again, we're yeah. I, I would always I always my default is always going to be, you know, we're in the people business, even if we're talking about an individual event, you know, uh, whether we're talking a swimmer or a gymnast or, you know, figure skater, doesn't matter if we're using, you know, sports analogies, but it, it's all about nobody got there by themselves. Yeah, you know, nobody yeah. just did it no. on their own. Nobody, no, no, no. Um, you know, you talk about. I read, I, I saw that one question, and I don't recall exactly what it was, but you were talking about Michael Phelps and uh, his coach, and yeah. how you know they, they were kind of they were just made for each other, you know. Right. And everyone's like yes. Michael Phelps, and and this is not a backhanded compliment no. to him, but you know, the guy was kissed by the hand of God for sure, but uh, yeah. or by the mouth of God for sure, but somebody got him. Somebody got him going. Yeah. It, it was yeah. a one-two punch. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of my goals in this was to get you to say that's a great question. So I'm, I'm, I feel like I achieved one of my goals. I, I'm, I feel pretty proud of myself. Thank you for answering the the, the question on the on the bullets. I've always had that in my mind. I've never I've never asked anybody about that, but um, you described it uh, very vividly. I, I didn't know about the sound and the smell. That's intense. Um, you know, crazy. But uh, l let me ask you this as well. So. Uh, you know, you, you, in swimming, there's talent. You, you talked about Phelps, right? Like a guy like Phelps clearly has talent from a young age, but if you know anything about Michael, he applied and maximized his talents, just like a guy like LeBron James, I think of who, you know, at, at, at 16 was this, uh, you know, this freak of nature kid coming out of high school and look at him now he's playing in the NBA year 20, 21, 22, whatever it is. And he's dominating still. So, you know, here's a guy that's maximized his talent in, in the military. Are there people like that? Are, are there people born to be soldiers? Are they, are they people with the talents to rise above? And, and, and when you see them, you know that they're different. Yeah, no, they are. And, and it's a, it's a phenomena. I don't know that I could, if you said, Matt, write a, write a short essay on that particular phenomena. Right. Um, I don't think I could, but I, so I know, you know, you know it when you see it. And I mean, there right. are, um, yeah. you know, nobody's perfect clearly, but yeah. there are these young guys. And when I say guys, I'm just saying, because um, when I was in the infantry it was all male and it's since been, been integrated. So I, but I never served with women, but right. when I say, when I say all guys, you know, these guys would come in from varieties of backgrounds. Some were athletes, uh, I did it interesting enough find that athletes and Boy Scouts always always did well, almost universally did well compared to kids at Jordan. But um, you know, there were just some kids that would come in, and uh, maybe it was their maturity right off the bat. There was something that 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 stood out, and more often, I think it was just they were maybe a little more humble than you uh -huh. know young teenagers coming in to do it. Uh, but there were guys that you would just write up. They just got it. They would just, they were, you know, the, uh, um, you know, virtuosos. Uh, right. they, they just, they could, they could pick up a compass and learn. They, they knew how to navigate like yeah. right off the bat. None of the things, the skills and the talents that we have to, you know, spend a lot of remedial time getting somebody to, right. to fix, you know, they just, they just did it. And you're like, golly, I mean, what a, well, you're, they're so blessed by, by that and, and and again every once in a while it comes in they don't seem to have an Achilles heel and uh, they do exist I don't know how uh, I'm certainly not one of them I, I I learn by by failing at things a lot but you know yeah I choose yeah. the harder route yeah no I, I'm very similar in that well you you went on and had a had an incredible career in the military and then 
coming out, you've done incredible things as well. Uh, one of the, one of the things that you've done is is write bestseller novels and 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 uh, books. Um, you've got one that is uh, Walk in My Combat Boots, and and it's co-written with James Patterson. Um, that that's an extraordinary accomplishment as well. How did that come about? Yeah, so um, this is one of those, uh, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. And um, uh, I had a, a friend who I met that uh, asked me if I wanted to go do a documentary with him. Uh, and I'm like, I have no idea why on earth you would think I could possibly be somebody who would do a documentary. But the long and the short of it is I did. Uh, and this gentleman, Tim Malloy, um, is good friends with Jim Patterson. And uh, Jim got to see our, our little documentary. And uh, called me up afterward and said, "Hey, I, I like I like the way you talk to people. I like the way you you uh, you know handle yourself uh, doing this documentary. Um, I'd like to do a book. Let's do a book about soldiers." And I mean, literally, that was that was the guidance. And uh, you know, I think I, I I've said before, you know, I could old Matt Eversman would have talked himself out. I would have come up with a good excuse not to do it. I would have totally self-deprecated my way out of it. I would have, I, I would have run for the hills because um, yeah. I'm like, I have no business writing a book. Um, I have no business, you know, doing this, and let alone with the best-selling author in the world. Uh, yeah. Truly, and I mean, that's now you all know this. Uh, yeah. And yet, I have something about it. I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, Roger that. I'll do it, and uh, I'll, I'll learn. It's not even faking it. I'm like, I'll just learn as I go, and uh, if I don't know it, some I'll, I'll ask him. So that's a lot. A lot of dribble to your question. Uh, it was happenstance, luck and opportunity sitting around the corner. Well, it goes towards your, uh, you know, your your ultimate life success is this is this mentality that you have of like, look, I don't know how to do it, but I'll give it a go and I'll get into it and I'll I'll do it to the best of my ability. And I think when when people aren't afraid to tackle things that scare them, you know, we are, we're all scared, we're all human, uh, but. You know, it's the ones that are ultra ultra successful, the ones that just go in and and do it. You know, so good for you. Uh, you also have a company called Eversman Advisory. What do you guys do? Yeah, so we started. My wife and I started this after my my third attempt at employment after retiring. Um, you know, I just you know I was doing I was doing everything wrong uh, in my attempt to sort of find my new identity after the military and, 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 you know, follow my passion or whatever people like to call it. And, yeah. you know, I, I, the company I was working with was, uh, didn't do as well and decided they were going to pare down. And I was like, Oh shit, I gotta go get another job. Yeah. Um, I was just chasing money to be quite candid. Uh, yeah. Brett, I was chasing dollars instead yeah. of, um, you know, there was no more science to it than that. And I realized yeah. that that doesn't work. You know, you, yeah. you truly can't, can't do it for money. So we started, my wife said, well, why don't we try and help people not make the same mistakes that we've made, uh, yeah. which is code for, why don't you do this so you can help people not make the same mistakes that you made? I'm only kidding. Yeah. This is not here. But, you know, <laughs> it was the um, only I get this opportunity so infrequently. So I had to jump on. But but that was yeah. it. It's like, hey, let's help. Let's help soldiers. Um, let's help college kids get off the couch and figure out how to be competitive in the workplace let's let's yeah. let's try and like you and i are chatting about maybe we can instill you know a little bit of a pedagogy to that you know one get them out there you know fearless lead with your chin a little bit and two you know it's okay to be it's okay to want to be the best yeah that's yeah. that was our whole idea let's 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 get let's get, i'm tired of mediocre yep yep yeah you know yeah. Uh, that, that yeah. tired frustrating and we don't gotta we don't gotta do it yeah, I love it. Well, that's awesome, man. Well, um, people can find you if they if they want to reach out in in regards to this. Where can people find you? Yeah, the easiest way is just go on LinkedIn. You can find yep. me, Matt Eversman, on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I I must admit, and I I, I see this not to be um, you know a jackass, but I am going to sound like one. Uh, for the last couple of years, while um, though Jim Patterson and I have been working together, I, I've sort of put the Eversman advisory, you know, on the back plate, um, yep. just because I haven't had time to really yeah. be able to do them both. So, you know, I, I, I shut down our website and, you know, our podcast and everything for the last couple of years. But 
you know, if you need, if, if somebody were interested, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's uh, yeah, or yeah. clearly on uh, you know any question is uh, yeah. you can ask a question there. But uh, yeah, yeah, no, you know, yeah. one of these days we get back to it. Yeah, no, I've I'm I'm am so stoked you're on any question because I got so many more questions. I, I tried to get a couple in, but I had so many more that I want. But uh, you know, you're you're on there, you're answering questions, and um, it's going to be exciting to kind of dig in more into your story and and uh, listen to it. There's so much to learn from from your experiences. When, how, how long? So you, this is kind of the beginning of your career. Obviously, the Black Hawk Down situation. How long in the military did your career end up going? What what are some of the places you went? Yeah, I wound up spending t- 20 years on uh, on active duty. I retired in 2008. Um, you know, that was 1993. So I spent another yeah. you know 15 years on on active duty. Uh, mm. Did a lot of travel uh, all around the world for training. But my only other combat experience was in Iraq uh, in 2006. Um, from 06 to 07, I uh, was in Iraq during the surge mm. with my my unit. But uh, you know, as an aside, though. I, I, I got to tell you, the army was 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 so good to me. You know, the army gave me so many amazing experiences, um, and not the least of which was uh, I, I refer to this. You know, I got to see the other side of the mountain. Yeah. You know, I got to see just what's going on outside of my own little comfort zone, my own little you know hometown, my own little state, whatever it is. And, and I, I, I say that for a reason, you know, which I think comes back to this, everything we talked about today is like, man, you got to open your eyes. Don't be afraid to open yeah. up your eyes. Go, go see a little bit different. Go see. I mean, you, 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 you've been to two, lived in two continents yeah. and I don't even know yeah. out where else, but you know, that, that's what the army gave to me. And, um, yeah. you know, I'm far, I probably take that as the greatest thing it gave to me more than experiences in combat and, and everything else combined. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, listen, I appreciate your time today. It's a huge honor. I know that um, you're well sought after in many respects. So I appreciate you giving me time. That means a lot to me and and, and our audience um, and just sharing your stories and, and giving us some adv- life advice and uh, things that you learned. So so thanks for doing this today, Matt. Yeah, Brett. Well, listen, buddy, uh, anytime. I, I, I'm so blessed and honored to be a part and and again, I got a million questions for you, so I'm, I'm getting my fingers warmed up. Don't just you don't don't go to sleep early tonight, because uh, yeah. <laughs> seriously, well, I appreciate I appreciate you and and the opportunity to to hang out with you a little bit today and yeah. uh, talk and and hopefully hopefully something sticks with a there's a nugget or two in there. Oh, there's there's a lot of stuff. If people are listening, they need to they need to get it. Uh, it's it's all good stuff. So I appreciate it, Matt. All right, take care, my friend. All right, buddy. Be safe. Have a great weekend. We'll talk soon. All right. Bye.